So everybody, I'm going to start recording this. You're going to see something across your screen that says I'm recording. Just wanted yeah. you to be aware of this. This is for people who couldn't make it today. Okay. I'm so glad you're doing this. Yeah, Thank you. This. Veda, it's so much fun. I love it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right, we're gonna mute it in a bit when she has to start talking, okay, Dad? We will mute our microphone in a bit when she starts talking, okay, Dad? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so we start talking now? No, she'll start when she's ready. <laughs> Another minute or here. One, two, Three, four, five. We've got five people so far. This is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good. We're going to get started in another minute or so. It's 1029 right now. We'll get started in another minute. Okay. And? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Elaine. Hi. I, I missed last week. You said you were recording. Can, how can I get that recording? We can mail it to you. I can email it to you. And by registering with Zoom, I now have your email address. So I'll email you today. I'll tell you what, everybody will get a recording of today and also last week's recording. How about that? That's all right. OK. That's Thank okay. you. You're welcome. We got some more people. Good. Good. Uh, Leslie, it's 1030. Would you like to start? Can I, can I do a quick intro? Yes. yes. Yeah? <laughs> All right, let's do it. Hello, everyone. My name is Ann Vota. I am the Director of Health and Wellness at the Center for Adults mm -hmm. Living Well at the YMHA and YWHA of Washington Heights and Inwood. And I am in my living room now, but I can't wait to see you one day back at the Y. And today we are with Leslie Day. Today you are showing, you are, you are seeing a virtual visit to Fort Tryon Park with naturalist Leslie Day. Leslie Day is an author, a friend of the neighborhood, and a naturalist. And she is also author of many books, including this one. And I, you probably are seeing it backwards. But the name of the book that I have personally is Field Guide to the Street Trees of New York City. She's written so many others. And I'd like to welcome Leslie Day. Thank you, Leslie. Hi, Anne. Hi, everybody. It's so nice to be here with you. I'm also a member of the Senior Center. My husband and I go there to dance and take other classes. Um, so we're going to start where we left off last week. We got about a third of the way through the lower park. We started on Bennett Avenue and walked north through the park. Um, and today we're going to go all the way to Dykeman. Uh, this is a photograph I took a couple of weeks ago and I'm gonna use my cursor to show you, this is when those beautiful Kwanzaa cherry trees were blooming. They're no longer blooming, um, but we're gonna see some beautiful trees. Okay, let's see here now. Let me go back. Uh, when I left my apartment this past weekend, something started flying back and forth quickly in front of my face. And when I was able to focus on it, I realized that it was a red admiral butterfly, which is a butterfly that migrates north uh, in the spring. And so it can travel a thousand miles or more. And it is a really beautiful little butterfly. Uh, this is a close up of it, that I, of one that I took uh, last summer in Fort Tryon Park. Um, they are extremely territorial. So when they arrive, arrive up here, they find a place and they claim it as their territory. And then they fly, they patrol it. They fly back and forth, back and forth. And they'll chase away birds. I've seen them chase away sparrows. I've seen them chase away blue jays. I've seen them chase away bumblebees and carpenter bees and honey, honey, honey bees. I've seen them chase away wasps. Uh, they don't want anyone in their territory. They allow us humans to walk by and sometimes they'll sit on us and use us as a perch. And they do all of this 
to attract a female. And so the red admiral that's the fastest and most determined will get a mate. Um, so when you, when you see a little orange and black butterfly zooming around, it's a red admiral. As you walk along so almost any part of the park, you'll start to see this plant with really large leaves. And this is a burdock plant. When the colonists came here um, from England, they didn't know what plants they'd, they'd find. So they brought seeds of plants that they knew that they could eat and that they could use medicinally. Um, and one of the plants was the burdock. And um, it's a biennial, which means that the first year, it sends up a rosette of very large leaves. The second year, it sends up a flower stem with flowers that look like this, that have a very spiky bottom. And they turn into seeds that look like this, which are the bane of most dog owners because, um, our last dog was a little terrier named Sadie, and she would root around in the plants and come out with these burdock seeds all over her face, her bushy eyebrows, around her lips, around her nose. This is a strategy that the plant is designed to disperse their seeds. So they use animals to carry their seeds far and wide. But if we walk by them, you can see the tiny little hooks that will stick onto your socks and your pants and your shirts and your jackets and hitch a ride. The burdock is not only has nutritional leaves, it has a nutritional root, and a very long, thick tap root that's hard to get out of the ground. So if you wanna get rid of your burdock, you have to use a, a pointy shovel and go down pretty deep and you have to pull very hard. A year ago, uh, my family and I were in Japan and, and at almost every breakfast in the inns we stayed in, they served pickled burdock roots and they were delicious. Um, at our complex in Fort Tryon Apartments, we have a very active garden committee. And one of the members of our garden committee is an experimental cook, Ernie. And he said, well, let's try, let's make it. So we dug up a burdock root, he chopped it up and he pickled it and he served it at the next garden committee meeting. It was delicious. As we walk along, you'll see trees that have a bark that looks like this. This is the common hackberry tree. And until I was writing my books, I had never really noticed it. But once you notice it and learn about it, you start to see them everywhere. It's quite a common park tree. It is the host plant for the morning cloak butterfly. Um, butterflies and moss will only lay their eggs on certain plants. That's because their caterpillars will only eat certain leaves. So the morning cloak is a very large butterfly that emerges from a winter hibernation uh, in early spring and will lay her eggs in great multitudes on the twigs of hackberry, leaf, hackberry trees. Um, this is a magnification of the eggs, but you can see they're so beautiful. And when the little caterpillars hatch out, they'll devour some of the leaves of the hackberry. These are the hackberry flowers. They're tiny, inconspicuous green flowers, but they produce hackberries that birds love. Um, the, the Baltimore Oriole eats them, and the Eastern Bluebird. The cedar waxwing loves them, and even American robins love them. That, this is a healthy looking hackberry tree, uh, leaf, but I can start to see some little eggs that were laid here by a different kind of insect. And that insect is the hackberry leaf insect known as psyllids. And psyllids lay hundreds of eggs on each one of the hackberry leaves. And when the eggs hatch into the little larva, they start to eat the leaves. As a defense, the leaves grow cells around the larva, forming galls, what's known as galls. Let me get rid of this so I can... Um, this is one kind of gall. This is a blister gall. Um, inside the gall, the little larvae continue to feed where they are now protected inside their own little house. 
And as they emerge through metamorphosis into the insect state, into the adult stage, they'll eat their way out and fly off. But you can really identify a hackberry tree, not only by the warts on the bark, but by seeing the leaves covered in galls, which does not kill the tree. Thank goodness. Let me go back here. Our next tree has an interesting bark. Um, it has an orange underbark and kind of flaky ridges. And it is a sycamore maple. They are all over the park. And um, they have highly textured, very large opposite leaves. Uh, the new leaves come out opposite each other and they are just glorious. Um, these are some I saw a couple of days ago, very red new leaves. And they are in flower now and the flowers are hanging in panicles and each flower produces a double seed that has a wing on it called a Samara, which helps it fly down from the mother tree so it can be dispersed. And I don't know if you did this when you were kids, but I remember doing this where you'd break them apart and stick them on your nose. So all maple trees develop these Samaras and they are sticky. Right next to that tree is a tree we saw last week and it's the American beech tree. And remember I said that it's about the only tree where you can carve your, inna your initials into it. And as the, the tree grows in girth, the bark expands and the initials get larger. And I'll just repeat this because it's so lovely. But Roma Roman lovers used to say, as this tree grows, so may our love. Next to it is a tree that is covered in enormous thorns on the lower bark. It's also coming into leaf right now and, and it's flowering and it's called the honey locust tree. Here are the flowers and you can start to see the ovaries of the flowers are starting to form the seed pods, which look like this in the summer and like this in the fall. They fall to the ground. When I was a pre-K teacher, we used to collect them and make musical instruments out of them. This tree is an ancient tree. And 10,000 years ago, well, oh, before I say that, th this is one of the uh, honey locust trees in Riverside Park. And I just had to include this picture because the thorns were so thick and so fierce. But this tree's seed pods were eaten 10,000 years ago when mastodons roamed this area. And, um, uh, in 1925, when they were putting up a building on the corner of Seaman and Cumming in Inwood, they found the skeleton of a mastodon. And I believe it's now at the, it's still at the American Museum of Natural History on 81st Street. But they believe that the, that the tree used those thorns as a defense to keep the mastodon from climbing up and getting all the seeds and eating them. Um, and what else did I want to say? Oh, the city has tried to develop, uh, to plant a thorn-free honey locust uh, because so many people have sued the city when they walk into the tree and get a, a thorn in their eye or somewhere near their face or their head or their body because they're sharp. But um, eventually those trees will start to produce thorns so they, they can't seem to get away from it. Um, in the fall, they fall down. They're called, the seed pods fall down. They're called honey locusts because they have a very sweet pulp inside that the animals love. The birds will peck, peck them open to get it. And this is our modern day mastodon feeding on the sweet pulp of the seed pods. There's a little tree in that same meadow, uh, a beautiful little tree. This lady and her dog are sitting in the shade. Of, and it's called a service berry tree, but it has several names. And one of them is called the Shad Blow because it's, when it was flowering in April is the time of year when the American Shad, a migratory fish, leaves the Atlantic Ocean and swims up the Hudson River to lay her eggs. 
and they come up by the millions. Uh, so that's one name, Shadblow. Another is Juneberry. The flowers, this is what they look like now, produce berries that are ripe in June. Uh, so that's another name. And here's a picture of a little song sparrow that I saw uh, gorging on these berries. These berries are filled with sugar. They're delicious. They're edible for humans too. I don't eat them because I know the birds love them. But another name for this tree is the service berry tree because when it flowers and forms berries, the, the ground has thought enough to bury the dead. And so for the pioneers, they called it the service berry because that's when people had died in the winter could be buried. In that same little grove of trees is another kind of locust called a black locust. It has a beautiful bark with deep crisscross interlaced fissures. Um, in June, it produces very fragrant flowers filled with nectar and pollen and the pollinators love it. You'll start to see these flowers uh, in another month. Um, it is the host plant for the silver spotted skipper and that's a very common little butterfly here. Also a very fast moving butterfly. Um, the leaves are compound. And uh, so this whole thing is a leaf and these are tiny little leaflets, but this is where the silver skipper will lay her eggs. And then they produce seed pods that look like this in the fall. Here's another plant that the colonists brought over for food and medicine is called curly dock. It's in flower now, but it produces seeds that look like this. It's quite invasive. They also, these are seeds that in the fall will stick to your clothing. Um, you'll find this everywhere, but it's foraged by people who, in, who like to cook the leaves and to make flour out of the seeds. So that's curly dock. The seeds are kind of curly. I just think it's so pretty. This is a London plane tree. Um, over 15% of New York City trees are London plane trees. So there are more London plane trees than any other tree in the five boroughs. They were a favorite tree of Robert Moses, who was the parks commissioner for many, many years. Um, he had them planted all along the streets because they get huge and they have an enormous canopy which gives a lot of shade. Um, they have a very interesting history. In the 17th century, the, the gardener to King Charles I in England um, traveled a lot to collect seeds of trees from all over the world and brought them back to uh, Kew Gardens and to Vauxhall Gardens in London. And he collected the seeds of the American sycamore, an enormous tree and planted them in his garden near the Eurasian sycamore um, and they hybridized. So when the American sycamore flowered, it received pollen from the Eurasian sycamore and formed a new kind of plant, which they called the London plane trees. So the London plane tree has parents and include American sycamore and, and Eurasian sycamore. The leaf looks like this, you know, I didn't say this last week, but in my tree book, the artist is my best friend of close to 60 years, Trudy Smoke. Um, and her drawings are just beautiful. This, this is the, the leaf for the London plane tree. And the New York City Parks Department uses that leaf as its symbol. Um, there is a London plane tree in our park that's actually labeled, which is really nice. There are a few labels on the trees as you walk along the lower park. It has a really interesting bark. My, when my son, who is now 40, was little, he called it the G.I. Joe tree because it looks, the bark is, looks like a camouflage, right? This is another bark that's thin, and when it expands, when it grows in girth, the bark pops off in flakes. And during the growing season, which starts now, you will, you will begin to see the flakes of, from this bark laying all over the ground. A lot of our London plane trees have these lumps and bumps. 
And it turns out that when they were just starting to grow, when they were saplings, they got some kind of a, a, a fungal infection. And the tree responds by growing um, extra cells to contain it. Um, but it gives it this look. It's still very healthy. It's not sick. The flowers, and it should be flowering soon, there are two types of flowers on the same tree. There are the male flowers that look like this and the female flowers that are red. And the female flowers receive the pollen and then they produce the seeds. Uh, and these are the seed balls that hang in the fall and then fall off the tree in January or February and the birds eat the seeds. As I was walking along, I looked at the Manhattan schist outcrops and throughout our park, you will see things like this. When the men were blasting the rock so they could create paths, and this of course is during the Great Depression, um, and John D. Rockefeller Jr. who created the park hired tens of thousands of men who were out of work, actually they should be doing things like that right now, um, to put people back to work. And what they would do is they would drill a hole and they would put sticks of dynamite in there to blow the rocks up and create the path. And as I was walking along, I saw one of those little holes and sure enough, there's a little plant seed that landed in there and is growing out toward the light. Laying on the ground, you'll see dead trees. This is a dead cherry tree. I know it's a cherry tree because it has these very long lenticels. And last week I talked about lenticels being the breathing pores uh, on the bark of trees to take in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. Um, this is a dead cherry tree and it's being decomposed by a mushroom called the turkey tail mushroom. And turkey tail mushrooms are colorful because they often have different algae growing on top of them. The algae use them as a platform in which to photosynthesize and then produce sugars that the mushrooms use. So this is a symbiotic organism of mushroom and algae. And the, the mushroom is decomposing the dead tree, turning it back into soil. Nearby, this beautiful little tree that's flowering right now called the Carolina Silver Bell. These are the flowers. This is a photograph of an Eastern tiger swallowtail, a very common butterfly in our area feeding on the flowers. You'll see these all summer long, uh, these, these butterflies. And each flower produces a little lantern-like seed pod. On the hill above it is a building. When it was built in, this is pictures from 1932, it was built as a comfort station. So it had bathrooms, I guess it still has bathrooms, but it's obviously closed. And I know if you go into the park, you know you've seen this. Um, in 1995, when the park was falling into disrepair, Bette Midler and the New York Restoration Project came into our park and they cleaned it up and they use this building to house their tools. Oh, before I leave that, they also took over the New Leaf Cafe, created the New Leaf Cafe, and I'll talk about that next week. Um, next to the comfort station is a very tall um, oak tree. This is a picture of another oak tree, but I wanted to show you how to recognize oak trees. The lower branches hang down and the middle branches go straight out and the upper branches go straight up. The oak tree leaves have a very narrow blade. Here's one of Trudy's pictures again. Um, so this is the leaf blade. It's the narrowest of all the oak trees. It has deep sinuses. These are the lobes. And it produces acorns that I think are so beautiful. They have little green and yellow stripes. They're small acorns. They're much smaller than the uh, red oak acorns we saw last week. And they're loved by birds. Um, I think I showed this picture last week, but I, I, it's, it has a lot of interesting features. So this is a common grackle, um, which is in the, in the blackbird family. 
an amazing thing on this graphical is an organ inside its upper palate called a keel that has a sawed edge and can saw open acorns, which you know are really hard. Right in that little valley where the um, Kwanzaa and cherry trees are, is a stand of yew trees. Yew trees are conifers, they're needle leaf trees. And yew trees, uh, the genus is called Taxus, and they produce a chemical called Paxitaxel, which is used in chemotherapy to cure breast cancer and other cancers. So yew trees are very valuable trees medicinally. Um, they have lovely bark, smooth bark. I know the gardener uh, cuts off some of the lower branches, so you can see the, the sculptural form of these trees. Right now they're flowering, so they have male, um, they're not really flowers, they're cones, they're, because they're conifers, so these are the male cones. The female cones produce berries surrounded, uh, no, I can't just show you this, surrounded, here's the berry, surrounded by the, um, an arrow. I'm really sorry, but my bird is making that noise. <laughs> buddy, Jim, would you come get Buddy? Um, so the berry and every part of this tree is poisonous. It's only these little red arrows, A-R-I-L, that are soft and edible to birds. Uh, and squirrels. So here's a little sparrow eating one of them. Next to, oh, he flew. <laughs> Next to the taxis trees is this shaft. It's an air shaft for the A train, which runs underneath and brings air down into the subway uh, tunnel. And now, you know, it was built in the 30s or late 20s. And now, of course, it's covered with vines. And I think really beautiful. Across from that is um, the entrance of the park on Dungan Street. <coughs> Sorry. And um, there's a beautiful little garden there. Right now, it's just spring flowers. It's really gorgeous in the summertime. But let, let's look at some of them. These are the Spanish bluebells that are everywhere in the park now and really um, covering the ground under the Siberian elm in, in the heather garden. And the columbine is starting to flower. Here's a close up, the beautiful columbine flowers and a, a fern called the Japanese painted fern is everywhere now. This is a lovely ground cover called epimidium. And these are the little yellow flowers that they produce. And right now the ornamental onions are flowering. They're just opening up from their sepals and they'll be flowering for quite a long time. We should see them in the Heather Garden next week. And the beautiful little uh, flower comes from a bulb called the Star of Bethlehem. This is an interesting flower because it not only will stay where you plant it, but it will start to grow outside of where you plant it. And, and across the path from this, you'll see stars of Bethlehem opening up all over the place. When I was first learning about trees, uh, I took some classes at the New York Botanical Garden, and I, I took classes all over the place. And I was told that one way to identify the black cherry's tree is to look at the bark, because it looks like it's covered in burnt potato chips. And that has stuck with me for 30 years. This is what the bark looks like in the tree in our neighborhood. It has very glossy, waxy leaves, and it's producing flowers right now. Um, long panicles of flowers that smell quite sweet. And soon they will produce cherries, wild cherries. That's another common name of this tree, the wild cherry tree. Uh, woodpeckers love these cherries. This is a little downy male. You can tell because there's a little red patch on the back of his head that the female doesn't have. And these are Flickers, flickers are woodpeckers that are migrating in now. 
the male flicker, these are babies, but the male has um, <clears throat> a black mustache that the female doesn't. This is a red-bellied woodpecker, a very common woodpecker year-round um, in our neck of the woods. And unless you get a view like this, these are photos by Beth Bergman, who is the photographer on my bird guide, New York City bird guide, and she stood underneath and got this picture. You can actually see the red belly. They're gorgeous birds. They were pretty they are pretty big woodpeckers and they love the cherries, as does this little bird. This is the yellow-bellied sapsucker. This is a male in glorious plumage. Uh, Baltimore Orioles love the berries. This is, you might see these nests hanging from trees. The Orioles weave their nests and this is the male feeding the babies. And the gray catbird loves the cherries. And here's a mom feeding her baby. This tree is hard to see, but I wanted to point it out. It's kind of hidden. It's on the hillside. But right now it's in flower. It's called the Paolonia tree or the princess tree. It is considered a weed tree. And I'll, I'll show you why in a minute. But boy, the flowers are beautiful. The flowers produce these seed pods. They also produce very, very large leaves, enormous leaves. Each seed pod holds thousands of seeds. And when the seed pod opens, the wind blows them and they grow everywhere. This is a little plant that was loved and treasured by the colonists. And that's why they brought them over here. This is a dandelion and um, I have so much to say about the dandelion. This is a, an illustration by Mark Klingler from my very first book, Field Guide to the Natural World of New York City. But um, the, the name dandelion is, comes from the French, dent de lion, dent meaning tooth of the lion, because the leaves look like a lion's tooth. Uh, let me go back. Every flower head contains individual flowers. Each one of these that we think of as petals, as a petal is a complete flower that looks like this. So the female part of the flower is here, the male is part of the flower is here containing the, um, the pollen. Um, and each flower produces a single seed. It also has a very long taproot, which is why it makes the dandelion hard to kill. I mean, it's very hard to, they're almost impossible to pull out. If you run a mower over it, it still leaves the taproot. And so a new, new uh, flower stem and leaves can grow from that. The birds love the seeds. And the pollinators really cherish this flower. It's one of the flirt first flowers to come out in the spring. And so the honeybees who will hibernate over the winter um, as soon as it's warm enough, will come out and get nectar and pollen, and they store their pollen in little pollen baskets right here and bring it back to the hive. And then when the flower goes to seed, um, oh, I just love this picture. It looks like a little pin cushion, right? Each, each seed is stuck in there. And then when a, a child comes along and blows it, or the wind comes along, each seed is carried by its own parachute and is dispersed from the uh, parent plant to colonize a new area. So this is the entrance from Arden Street, <clears throat> sorry, and it's near the um, Ann Loftus playground. It's starting to get color. You can see a little uh, red bud tree there, uh, but it has beautiful bleeding hearts. This, I'm gonna see if I can play this little video for you. So here's a bumblebee trying to get nectar. Now he has to figure out, she has to figure out how to get into that flower. Ah, she did. She has to separate the bleeding part from the heart and get in there. Let me see, I might have to. Okay, this is a close up of the flower. And this is the, the drop of blood. And now it's been cut away. 
inside is where the pollen is and the nectar. So the bee or the pollinator has to go deep inside to get the nectar. So, so these flowers are just so interesting in the strategies that they've evolved to get the bees and, and, uh, and the long tongue bees to go in to get the nectar and get pollen on them so they'll pollinate the next flower. So if you look north toward, here's that playground, north toward Dykeman, it's just a series of elm trees. But looking south, we'll see a few interesting trees. Uh, this very tall one is what we're gonna look at next. And it's another tulip tree. We talked about that last week. And I'd said how the Native Americans use these trees to create dugout canoes because the trunk is so straight and so tall. Here's a close-up of the leaves. Remember, they have that notched tip. And a close-up of the beautiful bark. Along this wall on Broadway, you'll see this creeping vine called Virginia Creeper. It has a compound leaf with five leaflets and it flowers and produces berries that the birds love. This is a native plant, so it's really good for our birds. The berries are so beautiful and the stems are so beautiful, that bright red, which probably attracts some um, birds. Uh, this is a Cape May warbler eating the berries. By the way, if you go out birding, this is a great time because we have so many warblers migrating through right now. Uh, here's a little um, northern cardinal, a little female eating the berries. This is how they climb. They grow these tendrils uh, with little sticky pads that can hold on to walls, hold on to the barks of trees, hold on to windows. This is one of my favorite trees in the park. And you can see they put a fence around it to protect it. It's a red horse chestnut. Um, most American horse, uh, European horse chestnuts are huge, you know, 70, 80, 90 feet. But the horse chestnut we have in America is called a buckeye. And it's a, it's a small plant, it's a, it's a small tree. So what they did was they hybridized the European horse chestnut with the American buckeye to produce this beautiful little tree. Um, <clears throat> this is a buckeye leaf, it's a compound leaf and it's a fan compound. So um, it had, these are the leaflets. This is the flower, the panicled flower, beautiful. And it produces these seed pods called conkers because kids in, in Europe would take them and hit each other in the head with them and then they start doing that here. Um, and the squirrels love them. Here are the steps going up to the Alpine Garden. And the last five years, John Kelly and the gardeners have extensively planted either side of, both sides of these steps. Here are some of the flowers. These are wild geranium, that are in flower now, and the beautiful hosta leaf, which isn't in flower yet, but the leaves themselves are so ornamental. And eucara, or also known as coral bells, look at those beautiful leaves. This is what the coral bell flowers look like. So the, the steps lead up not only to the Alpine Garden, but to the cloisters and ultimately the Heather Garden. This is what the Heather Garden looks like now. So if you can get up there, it's spectacular. Um, so next week will be week three and we will start in the Heather Garden and we will, for the next two weeks, complete our tour there. So I'm pretty much done and I hope you have some questions, but I also wanted to say that if as you walk along, and if you have a smartphone or someone you know has a smartphone, you could take photographs of anything you're interested in and share them with us next week, and I'll help you identify plants. So thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie. 
the recording of this will be available later on this afternoon and I will send everybody an email and a reminder to come next week and a reminder that you can also, if you would like to send your pictures to me, to my email address, mm -hmm. that would probably be the easiest way and I can give them to Leslie. Thank Does that sound like a plan, Leslie? Say that again. So if I, um, if people email in the, in the email yes. I send out today, if people want to send me their photos. That was great. And then I would share them and then I would help you identify them. Yes. And if anybody has any questions, if you'd like to unmute yourselves, if you have any last minute questions for Leslie. Or anything. No, but you thank you very much. That was very interesting. Yeah, thank you very much, Leslie. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. I have your book on trees. I love that book. But thank you, Vida. This was even better today. <laughs> thank you. I love trees. <laughs> thank goodness for trees. <laughs> yeah. Okay. See you next week. All right. See you next week. week. Bye, everybody. Bye. Hi, thanks for bye -bye. joining you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you. Say bye then. Bye. Okay, leave me. So, Leslie, that was even better. Good. <laughs> yeah. All right, there you are. Good, I'm glad. I have no idea what time it is. Oh, good. So it was long. It was, uh, yeah, 30, 40 minutes. Good. Yeah, it was good. Okay, it's just us. It's just us, just Good. us, just us chickens. I'm going to stop recording. Here we okay. go.